Welcome everyone to uh, lecture 17. This series of lectures is on fluids and electrolytes. They expand and explain many of the concepts explained in my book, Manual of Fluid Electrolyte and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I am Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I am a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel. This is the book. You can find it on Amazon, and I'll provide more information in the description. We are still in Chapter 2, Hypokalemia. Today we are going to explain a rather difficult concept, a rather confusing concept. It is the aldosterone paradox. Fasten your seatbelts. First, a review. These are the segments of the nephron we said with potassium. Almost 100% of the potassium is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, the loop of Henle and distal tubule, and potassium in the urine is secreted. Okay, all the potassium that is present in the urine is secreted in the collecting duct. The four major factors that determine secretion of potassium in the collecting duct are aldosterone, by far the most important, distal fluorate, serum potassium itself, and delivery of an ion to the collecting duct. Now, if you have not watched lecture one and two on potassium, please do so, especially lecture two, before you go on and watch this lecture. We said there are two types of potassium channels, the ROMK, the renal outer medullary potassium channel, which is in the principal cells under the effect of aldosterone, its role is major, and then a rather minor role of the MAXI-K channel, the BK channel, they're activated by high flow through the collecting tubule. These channels are present in both the principal and intercalated cells. Now, aldosterone binds to the receptor in the principal cell. It activates the sodium-potassium ATPase pump and also the ENAC, the epithelial sodium channel, which is on the uh, apical side of the principal cell. Now, the ENAC makes the cell absorb sodium. That leaves a negative charge, and then potassium goes out via the ROMK, the renal outer medullary potassium channel. Now, what is the aldosterone paradox? We can deduce from what, what we just said that aldosterone really has two roles. It makes you absorb sodium. Now, this is very desirable in case of hypovolemia. And it makes you get rid of potassium. And these two things are connected, but sometimes we want one and not the other. So, Aldosterone enhances sodium absorption and case secretion in the collecting duct. In case of hypovolemia, sodium reabsorption is desirable. That's what we want, so we can restore volume. But we don't want a concomitant potassium excretion, because then we'll end up with hypokalemia, which we don't need. We just want the sodium to go up, but not the potassium to go down. In hyperkalemia, we want to get rid of potassium. But we don't want increased sodium reabsorption because that will lead to hypervolemia and possibly high blood pressure. So in case one, we want the sodium in, but not the potassium out. In case two, we want the potassium out, but not the sodium in. Now, how does the body accomplish that? How can the body separate these two roles of aldosterone? Now, in case of low effective circulatory volume, meaning low effective arterial volume, the renin and angiotensin aldosterone system, RAS, is activated. Now, when it is activated, you have an increase in angiotensin 2, then renin, and subsequently aldosterone. This RAS activation will increase sodium reabsorption where? In the proximal tubule, under the effect of angiotensin II, that's a very well-known thing, angiotensin II increases sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule, and also we have an increase in sodium reabsorption in the collecting tubule due to the effect of aldosterone. That's desirable. Now, when that happens, when 
your sodium is getting reabsorbed, what's going to happen to the distal flow rate? It's going to go down. And this, in turn, decreases potassium excretion. We said the BK channels, they're activated by high flow. If you don't have, if you don't have high flow, then potassium excretion is going to go down. Therefore, we are minimizing the effect of aldosterone. So in this case, we have achieved sodium reabsorption without an increase in potassium secretion. Now, what's going to happen in hyperkalemia? In hyperkalemia, aldosterone secretion is increased. We said when you have high potassium, it is in and of itself a driver for an increase in aldosterone secretion. Okay? But angiotensin II is not activated. There's no reason for the renin angiotensin system to be activated because of hyperkalemia. It's activated in hypovolemia, like we just said. So therefore here, distal delivery of sodium is intact, is maintained. You have good flow. And therefore, potassium excretion will be increased. We talked about the BK channels, okay, activated by high flow. But there's no increase in net sodium reabsorption. Why? Because the angiotensin system is not activated. So you have regular sodium absorption, but you don't have it increased like in case of hypovolemia. So then mission accomplished. We got rid of the uh, potassium, okay? The aldosterone is up, but it, not, it did not lead to increased sodium reabsorption. So in hypovolemia, aldosterone increases sodium absorption without loss of K, and in hyperkalemia, aldosterone enhances K excretion without an increase in net sodium uh, uh, reabsorption, and this is the paradox. This is, in summary, in two words, what aldosterone paradox is. Now, so far, what I have said is enough, but we did not really explain the molecular mechanism of how that happens. Okay, now, if you're satisfied with what I've said, you can stop here and go and watch the next video, okay? If you're fond of renal physiology and complicated slides, then stay on, by all means. Okay, now, I apologize for the complexity of this concept, but again, this is not for everyone. Some of uh, our audience are sophisticated physiologists, uh, experienced nephrologists, and they may like this. Okay, so protein expression along the distal nephron. Here we have three segments. The DCT1, which is the early segment of the distal convolute tubule, the DC2, which is the late segment, and the CNT, which is the connecting segment. And as you can see, in the two segments of the distal convolute tubule, the NCC is expressed. The NCC is the electroneutral thiazide sensitive sodium chloride co-transporter. Okay, this is where thiazides work in the distal convoluted tubule. While in the connecting tubule and later on in the collecting duct, the ENAC, the epithelial sodium channel, is expressed. Now, as far as potassium channels, you can find ROMK and BK channels all along. AT1 receptor, this is the angiotensin 1 receptor, also is present. The MR, the mineralocorticoid receptor for aldosterone, is present. And uh, the 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 2 is present in the DCT2 and CNT. And more on that later. I mean later in later lectures. Now, as far as the, uh, uh, the protein involves, and all these uh, proteins are expressed and they facilitate all the cellular functions we're going to talk about. We have the NED42, we have the SGK1, SPAC, and then we have a variety of uh, WINK proteins. WNK is pronounced WINK, and it's with no lysine kinases. Now, the ASDN is the aldosterone-sensitive distal nephron. So what we have achieved here, we talked about different channels in different segments of the distal convoluted tubule and the connecting tubule or connecting uh, segment, and we talked about different expression proteins and channels. Let's talk for a second about NED42. 
NET4-2 is neuronally expressed, developmentally downregulated 4-2. Uh, this is a hect type ubiquitin ligase. It is involved in multiple regulation of multiple membrane proteins. Okay, so all these are regulatory proteins in a complex, uh, in complex pathways. Now, NET4-2 is demonstrated to regulate endocytosis and lysosomal degradation of the epithelial sodium channel, ENAC. We just talked about it. It's in the connecting segment and the collecting tubule and other ion channels and transporters. Okay, now, uh, contrary to some popular uh, belief, NET4-2 was not discovered by Ned Flanders, Oakley Doakley. Now, the WNK with no lysine kinases, this is an important family of proteins. This is composed, composed of four members, WNK1, WNK2, WNK3, and WNK4. WNK2 is expressed in the colon, while WNK1, 3, and 4 are expressed in the kidneys. Now, the expression of ion transporters and channels are modulated by WNK1 and WNK4, and these families are serine threonine kinases. WNK, like we said, with no lysine kinase. WNK1 and WNK4 play a critical role in the regulation of sodium and potassium transport in the distal nephron, and mutations in the genes encoding these two kinases are present in inherited hypertension and hyperkalemia disorder, or Gordon syndrome or pseudohypoaldosteronism type 2. We're going to talk about that when we talk about uh, hyperkalemia and, again, metabolic uh, acidosis. So it's important to at least be familiar with the term uh, WINK. Okay, so this is what actually happens. Okay, this is the molecular mechanism of the aldosterone paradox. Under basal conditions, WNK4 acts as an inhibitor of the NCC, which is the thiazide-sensitive sodium chloride channel, ENAC and ROMK, all along the distal nephron. When we have hypovolemia, we activate the angiotensin II and aldosterone. Okay, in that case, WNK4 is going to inhibit ROMK all along the distal nephron, but is going to upregulate the NCC and the ENAC because what do you want here? You want to reabsorb sodium. So the NCC and the ENAC are going to be activated and you don't want to get rid of potassium. So the ROMK is going to be inhibited. Now, during hyperkalemia, the WNK4 is going to inhibit both the uh, physi sensitive sodium chloride channel, the NCC, and the ROMK in the DCT1, the first segment of the distal convolute tubule. So therefore, you're going to have increased distal de delivery of sodium because um, you're not going to have much sodium reabsorption there. Now, in the latter segment of the distal convolute tubule and the connecting segment, this WNK4 is going to activate the ENAC and the ROMK all along these two segments and along the collecting tubule, and this is going to favor sodium and potassium exchange, and it's going to activate the BK channels. Why is that? Because you have increased flow. You have decreased sodium reabsorption in the first segment of the distal convolute tubule, so you're going to have more flow of urine and therefore more potassium excretion. So again, mission accomplished. We got rid of potassium, and we did not have increased sodium reabsorption. So this is the true mechanism, okay? This is the molecular mechanism of the uh, aldosterone paradox. Now, if you cannot get enough of this subject, um, this complicated paper, Renal Potassium Physiology, Integration of Renal Response to Dietary Sodium Depletion, would explain it further. It's by very famous authors, uh, Dr. Camel, Do Dr. Uh, Schreiber, and Dr. Halpern, really prominent figures in the field of electrolytes and potassium. It's in Kidney International 2018, volume 93, pages 41 to 53. I'm going to stop here. I hope that you're not dizzy, and uh, see you in the next lecture.